In the early days of Five Nights at Freddy's, fan games didn't quite have the same hold on the community as they do today. Not only were there far fewer of them, but a lot of the time their quality left a lot to be desired, with a few exceptions, of course. However, the same cannot be said for a fan game that was released on July 18th, 2015. This fan game had gotten closer to the quality and style of the original Five Nights at Freddy's than any fan game before it, and it would go on to become debatably the most popular fan game series that the franchise would ever spawn. I am, of course, referring to Emil Mako's Five Nights at Candy's. In this video, I want to take a look back on everything that this series has to offer as we await the highly anticipated fourth installment. I'll first go through every game and then include a section for lore. And with all that out of the way, let's begin. Before we continue, I'm proud to announce that this video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Surfshark offers a service that can encrypt your browsing data and swap your location to make it appear like you're somewhere that you're not. You might be thinking this isn't really useful for the average person, but you'd be wrong, because you can actually use VPNs to access streaming libraries from other countries to watch shows that might not normally be available to you. It also protects you from data and identity theft, such as from hackers or large companies attempting to sell your data. If you're prone to using public Wi-Fi, you are at risk of this. As the cherry on top, Surfshark allows you to use one account on an unlimited number of devices. So what are you waiting for? If you click on the link in the description, you can use my code MENAXA to get 83% off. Yes, 83% off, plus three extra months for completely free. If you're on the fence, don't worry, because Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's zero risk. Remember, the link is at the top of the description, so make sure to try Surfshark VPN today. Our story actually begins more than half a year before the release of Five Nights at Candy's. On November 21st, 2014, Emil Mako, the game's developer, posted this render of his original Five Nights at Freddy's character with the caption, Please meet Candy the Cat. He sure would like to meet you. Remember, Five Nights at Freddy's had only been out for like two months by this point, so Emil had done this pretty quickly. Even just the next day, he had uploaded multiple new renders of the character, which were much more polished and closer to the look that we know now. The next day, the jaw would be changed to fit the toy animatronic aesthetic from Five Nights at Freddy's 2, which had only been out for like two weeks. Over the next few weeks, leading into December, he would post even more renders of Candy and the new complimentary Cindy character to go along with him. On December 18th, he made a post about people using this admittedly very high quality for the time and Scott-esque fan art as fake Five Nights at Freddy's 3 teasers. Which is really funny considering what came out literally five days later. Oh yeah, by the way, if you haven't watched this video, you totally should. That series was a mess. Anyways, he would post a few more new characters in the passing months, and for some reason, he also made this. But his activity on social media platforms would slowly come to a halt. Eventually, these culminated in a Tumblr post on May 19th, 2015, hinting towards a secret project that has been using up all of his available time but he promised that it will hopefully be worth it. 11 days later, we got this. And then we got these. On July 3rd, he released a teaser trailer and eventually the release day came. He made a post on July 18th stating the release date would be that day. He also said, and I quote, I only intended for there to be one Five Nights at Candy's. There won't be a Five Nights at Candy's 2, nor a third or fourth installment. I will continue with updating the game if necessary, but that is all I'll do with the game." Well, we all know how that went. All jokes aside, the first game was finally released. What did it have in store for us? So, what is going on guys? This is Ryan here. And this is the Ryan here. And welcome to Indie Smash, and in this episode, 
we're going to be playing Five Nights at Candies for you all. What's up, YouTube? What's going on? Corey Kitchen here, and welcome to Five Nights at Candies. Yo, 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 what is up, my gladiator? Sam here, and we're back. Hello, everybody. My name is Markiplier, and welcome to Five Nights at Candies. Now, I've been rationing out the Five Nights. This game was big. Like, really big. Five Nights at Candies was almost universally adored by everyone. But what was so good about it? Let's talk about that. The game opens almost identically to Five Nights at Freddy's, with a newspaper advertisement beckoning people into an overnight security shift at Candy's Burgers and Fries. Also akin to Five Nights at Freddy's, the margin of the newspaper actually contains a hidden message. Though in this case, it's more of a behind the scenes look into the developer's thought process. In summary, it essentially boils down to him describing starting the development for the game on April 15th, after being told his characters were used without his permission because he received many suggestions to make a fan game with the character anyway, so he decided, yeah, I'll just do it. He decided to buy Click Team Fusion and develop the game since he was successful in designing the characters, the location, and the original game mechanic. He then goes on to describe his enjoyment in writing and voicing the game's phone guy and thanks the reader for playing the game. What a wholesome message. Once the night actually begins, the message left for you by the phone guy serves to explain the game's mechanics, which is pretty standard. You have one new message. Uh, hello? Hello? Hi? Uh, junior manager here. You have a door on the left and right of you, which is also standard, but a third opening across from you in the form of a window. The mechanic that really shines, though, is this game's unique quirk, the night vision. You see, for the most part, the cameras are pitch black by default, but you can use night vision to see what you otherwise couldn't. Another unique mechanic that sort of flies under the radar is how the power was implemented. The doors actually progressively drain more power the longer that they're closed, which means you're punished tremendously for keeping them shut over long periods of time. As expected, for the first few hours of night one, pretty much nothing happens. Um, but on this night, you will get familiar with Candy and Cindy. At some point, you'll notice a pair of white eyes staring at you through the darkness. Now, though this mechanic is great for the horror and visual aspects of the game, it may seem to make the cameras a little redundant on a surface level. Since, as long as you can see the eyes in the doorway, do you really need to look at the camera? Well, we'll talk about that more later. After the first night is cleared, an after night cutscene plays, and it seems like we're in some kind of factory, and there's a character that looks like the puppet that we're familiar with from FNAF 2, but it's kind of off, and he doesn't seem to be a particularly big fan of you. Night 2 is also rather uneventful, aside from under rare circumstances it only adds Chester, a chimp animatronic that acts similarly to the other two characters that we know now. This night also has its own cutscene, which shows that it's likely going to happen after every night. Uh, this time, however, the video feed is unavailable, just audio. And night 3 is where things start getting a little more intense, which is generally how the formula for these games goes. On top of all the previous animatronics becoming significantly more active, this night adds two new threats. On camera 11, which shows the drawing room, a plain looking animatronic named Blank has been sitting idle. His plain look and name are because he's meant to be a blank canvas for children to doodle on using crayons because he has a plastic coating on top of him or whatever, which is honestly a brilliant idea and character design. I could honestly see that being a real implementation in a, some random animatronic restaurant in real life. He goes through transitions from lifting up his head to then standing up and then disappearing. 
Immediately after he leaves Cam 11, he will be in Cam 5, which is right outside the window, and checking on him while he's there will cause him to punch the window in front of you, breaking the glass. And from there, he returns to his original position if you close the window door on him. So basically, it's like Foxy. Obviously, the problem is that the window of opportunity for actually closing the door on him isn't the largest, so you really have to pay attention to where he is. And to add even more difficulty to that, his eyes don't glow like every other animatronic, so you actually need the night vision to tell where he is. Pretty neat subversion of established gameplay. On a similar note, another animatronic whose eyes you can't see becomes active on this night. The phone guy refers to an incident that happened about a month beforehand that caused an older animatronic to be decommissioned and stored in the back. This is Old Candy, who is missing his eyes entirely. Due to this, he also cannot be seen on the cameras without night vision. He begins to move around on this night, but isn't much of a threat until night 4. Once night 3 is over, we get to see what is probably the aftermath of the audio that we heard the night before. On night 4, the difficulty gets ramped up. Old Candy is now active, appearing on the left door, but with no glowing eyes to let you know he's there. Because of this, the night vision must be used on the camera outside the door. This night's cutscene shows a reappearance of the puppet from before, now pointing at the newer toy models we're familiar with from the actual gameplay. And night 5 is basically just night 4 with far more aggressive behavior from Old Candy specifically. The phone guy alludes to an extra storage room that is off the camera system, saying that it's nothing special to pay any attention to. Alright, you've probably noticed uh, that there is an extra door in the second party room, uh, which is on um, camera 9, I think. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's not on the map, that's because it's, it's really nothing special. It's, it's like a storage room, uh, we don't go in there much. Like, I, I haven't even been in there myself, you know. I just wanted to inform you that you don't need to worry about it, and that it's not a mistake, that it's not on the map or anything like that. Uh, anyway, uh, you've done a great job so far. Uh, I'll talk to you next week. Uh, good night. Ironically, this kinda just serves to draw attention to it. Upon completing this night, the penultimate cutscene from this game sheds some light on the timeline of events in this game. Obviously, the gameplay itself takes place in 1987, since it follows the closing of the pizzeria from Five Nights at Freddy's 2. However, we see that the Candy's brand actually goes back decades before that, as the older line of animatronics seems to have been brand new in 1964. The puppet character is still present and seems to be directly communicating with the player this time, talking about a mistake and a problem that you may have caused. After this, we see our paycheck issued to a Mary Schmidt, with a haunting silhouette of an unfamiliar animatronic towering over it. Thus, we transition into the final night of the first game, which is Night 6. As expected, this night pumps the difficulty up pretty severely. At this point, the player is expected to have found the pattern of checking the left and right door cameras and blank in order to optimize power usage. On this night, the rat becomes incredibly aggressive, coming from both doors and also showing no signs of existence unless night vision is used. When this night is finally completed, we get our final cutscene, showing the rat along with the old candy and blank, still decades before the game begins. He seems to be rather old and tattered even here, which may be implying that he's from an even older generation of Candy's characters. He rises, walks around, and then stares at you with death-filled eyes. Based on the way the character is being framed, it seems like the rat is being advertised as the major antagonist. Finally, you get your overtime paycheck, and after completing the custom night, you get fired for tampering with the animatronics. And that ends Five Nights at Candy's. Now, you may be wondering why there are four more games that we still need to talk about in some capacity, since Emil explicitly said he wouldn't make sequels. And to answer that question, we need to refer to a Reddit post that he made after the release of Candy's 1, which elaborated on his mindset while creating the game in the first place. 
To summarize what he said, he starts with describing how the first game took him about three months to make because he was busy with exams and a summer vacation that he didn't develop on, understandably so, as well as being inexperienced with modeling at a level this sophisticated and being brand new to Click Team. The reason why he didn't want to make sequels originally is because he thought maybe FNAF 4 would be the end of the series, meaning the community would begin to die out. On top of that, since he was a little late to the FNAF fan game scene, he thought that the bucket of available original ideas and mechanics was nearly exhausted by the point that he came in. And to put a nail in the coffin, he also just didn't really have the time. He had to start looking for a job and just couldn't be at his computer all the time to develop a game. However, two of these circumstances changed. Obviously, he still has a job, but we know Five Nights at Freddy's 4 was not the end of Five Nights at Freddy's. Not only that, but once that game came out, shortly after Candy's, the available pool of mechanics that could still feel like a Five Nights at Freddy's experience, as well as what was perceived to be technically achievable within the Click Team engine were both revolutionized. When he actually sat down to think about why the first game took him so long, he realized most of it could be attributed to a lack of experience, and obviously he has that now. He knew doing it again would be much easier. After coming up with some new mechanics and ideas that he liked, he confirmed that Five Nights at Candy's 2 would indeed be coming, eventually. And just like last time, he released a bunch of teaser images leading up to the release of the trailer. From the teasers, we could parse that the game was probably taking place after Candy's one, because the animatronics were now withered. On February 4th, 2016, the trailer was released, and the game would release just a few weeks later. The game opens with a small cutscene depicting a chat room or private messaging prompt. Uh, the backstory goes that you've lost a bet between friends and have to spend five nights at a warehouse within an abandoned factory. And that factory just so happens to be the remains of Robotics Corp, which were responsible for manufacturing the animatronics for Candy's Burgers and Fries. In place of a phone call, the game begins with a set of basic instructions through text to make sure you understand the gameplay before it dunks you into the deep end. You sit at a desk in the dark, with your phone flash being your only source of illumination, and like most FNAF games, you're provided with a camera system as well. In a similar fashion to Five Nights at Freddy's 3, this game utilizes audio lures as your main defense against the animatronics in the form of office phone lines. The first night is incredibly simple, with only one animatronic to defend against, that being Cindy, though she's certainly in a state where you could say she's seen better days. You may have noticed there is a slight discrepancy in Cindy's design compared to what we know now, but I also wouldn't blame you for missing it. This is because the animatronic in this game is actually a withered version of a newer Cindy model. This gets confirmed in the new minigames that take place after every night, where these posters display the V2 versions of Candy and Cindy. In this first minigame, you play as Chester the Chimp, and the calendar in the security office confirms the year is 1989, which is two years after Five Nights at Candy's 1. The office also happens to contain a key that goes with a lock on the door to the storage room the rat is kept in. Upon approaching the door with the key obtained, the minigame comes to an abrupt end, and Night 2 begins. Night 2 also has instructions instead of a phone call, this time referring to Chester, who attempts to break into the vents. Simply use the phone in the room he's attempting to do this in, and he'll be scared away somewhere else. The rest of the gameplay is pretty much identical to that of Night 1. In the Night 2 minigame, you play as the Penguin. Your goal on this night is to collect the scattered pieces of Chester, who you played as in the previous minigame. From this, it can likely be assumed that the rat tore Chester apart when he entered the storage room, and the office calendar says 1989, just like before. Which means this could even be taking place later the same night, or at least within the same year. After collecting all three pieces, the minigame comes to an end, and the third night begins. The penguin is now an active participant, and withered new Candy is also added. Candy acts exactly the same as Cindy does, 
walking around random rooms and occasionally appearing down the hall just to be lured in by one of the phones. These are the standard wandering animatronics. The penguin, however, is a very unique animatronic compared to the rest. He acts similarly to Phantom Balloon Boy from Five Nights at Freddy's 3. He will appear very close to a random camera, and if you take too long to leave the camera or exit the interface entirely, he will shut down your camera system for a brief period of time, which includes the phones. This can easily make a situation go from bad to worse, so you have to be careful. Once you finish this night, the next minigame has you playing as blank. This time around, the objective is to find and retrieve four papers with drawings on them. The first one is right in front of you, and it depicts the new versions of Candy and Cindy. The next one seems to be a child asking where Chester is. Considering the office calendar says 1991, this means that for whatever reason, the company never bothered to restore him. The third and fourth drawings seem to be less significant, a child drawing a mustache or something onto blank, and a child imagining he's in a band with Candy and Cindy. Night 4 doesn't actually add very much, sort of just amping up the general game difficulty. The Night 4 minigame also doesn't actually seem to mean anything substantial, as it just has you playing as Cindy and returning Candy's lost tie to him, though it is worth mentioning this one takes place in 1992. Though Blank does have a rare chance to appear on Night 4, Night 5 is where he truly debuts. Unlike his unique nature in the first Candies game, his mechanics here are standard and he kind of just gets condensed into the wandering animatronic category, like Candy and Cindy. If I have to speculate, Emil may have been concerned with game balance and decided not to give Blank a unique mechanic for this reason because it might be too hectic. In general, the difficulty is taken to a higher level on this night, and at this point there are quite a few threats to deal with. Finally, we arrive at the Night 5 minigame where you play as the iconic Candy himself. In this minigame, you find a dead security guard in the office, and it looks like he died to some kind of blunt force trauma to the head. This takes place in 1993, and no other characters can be seen anywhere in the restaurant. When you venture to the left and go up, you get trapped and surrounded by police, and one of them tases you and the screen fades to black. Then we get our first ending. We can actually learn a lot from this headline. We can see that the game took place in August of 2007 within the abandoned Robotics Corp factory, and it seems to have closed the same year the security guard died that we just saw, and it stood for a total of 45 years, founded in 1962. After nearly 15 years of inactivity, the factory was finally set for demolition. In total, six fatal incidents occurred in the factory, the most famous of which being the death of twins who were run through the assembly machines of the factory in 1987. This is most definitely what we saw depicted in the cutscenes from Five Nights at Candy's 1. Though the factory would soon be demolished, the story was not quite over. Night 6 only has two animatronics, the rat and the cat. Though there are only two, they are highly aggressive. The rat has Chester's vent mechanic and the penguin's camera compromising mechanic. Despite this, Night 6 does actually definitely end up being easier than the previous nights. Even if they're supposed to be more aggressive, there are, in the end, only two threats to deal with. The final minigame after this has you playing as Old Candy, who hasn't yet made an appearance in this game at all up until this point. Similar to the Shadow Freddy in the FNAF 3 minigames, in a sense, you get lured by a Shadow Candy into a room, only to be attacked for doing seemingly nothing. However, that's not the end. You get to play again, this time as an undamaged blank. Like before, you must collect drawings, this time five of them. The office calendar says 1976, which was implied by Blank's undamaged state, but now we have confirmation this takes place before even the first Candy's game. The first four drawings aren't anything abnormal, but the fifth seems to show the Shadow Candy figure we just saw. Then Shadow Candy appears directly behind you, and the game once again switches to Old Candy's perspective. This time though, the instruction says just help. Unlike all of the minigames so far, this one seems to actually take place during normal operating hours of the restaurant. A lone adult can be seen in one of the rooms, and children and more adults, and others. 
Shadow Candy once again leads you elsewhere, and you find a lone crying child in the security office. This takes place in 1987. He seems comforted by your appearance, and he leaves. However, upon returning to the room with the lone adult, we learn why he was likely crying in the first place. His father is abusing him. Since the animatronics were most likely programmed to save children that are in trouble, and Old Candy sees this situation and misunderstands it, he takes action, and the minigame finally ends. This is definitely the incident that we heard from the phone guy in Candy's 1. Uh, uh, oh, and in case the animatronics is experiencing violence towards a guest, the animatronic will try to seek out the cause and uh, stop it. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I have no idea how it decides to do that, but after that day, uh, the animatronics don't really seem to function properly around adults, uh, especially not around the staff. Uh. And now we get our true ending. Factory burned to the ground. It seems like the teenage character that we played as had some kind of vendetta with this place, because not only did she decide to uphold the lost bet, but she also showed up a sixth time for seemingly no reason, since that wasn't part of the bet, only to burn the place to the ground when the morning came. There is one more detail left in this game, and it's actually quite important. Upon completing the game's hardest challenge, 720 Nightmare Mode or Night 8, the player is rewarded with a bonus cutscene that reveals a taste of what can be expected to be explored in the next game. As he did with the previous games, Emil would use his social media platforms to post teaser images leading up to the release of Five Nights at Candy's 3, and at this point it's obvious where the inspiration for each game came from. Candy's 1 was mechanically similar to FNAF 1, but visually similar to FNAF 2. Candy's 2 was mechanically and visually similar to FNAF 3, and Candy's 3 would sort of follow on this path, but this one was different. It shared the same vague concept of FNAF 4, but it didn't really feel as much as a copy this time. It felt much more like an original game, an actual refreshing spin on the formula. The game would undoubtedly be Emil's magnum opus, and it was obvious by how much time he was spending on it this time around. On June 19th, 2016, the main trailer for the game was released, but the full game wouldn't release for another nine months preceded, of course, by a demo and separate minigame trailer. Then, March 5th, 2017 came around, and it was time. I remember what you did. They remember too. You were the reason that we were all there. It happened because of you, and you can't tell anyone. Why would you? It is your fault. All of it. How are you feeling today? It's been two weeks. I understand that it was a very traumatic experience, but luckily your brother wasn't seriously hurt. You have to remember, they weren't real, they were just machines. They aren't capable of harming anyone. What happened was just an accident. He was just broken. But it's okay now. You're safe here. You remembered them from the theater? Ah, uh, yes, the old one that you and your father went to a year ago, right? Your father has told me about what happened while you were there. You got separated from each other that day when the incident happened. Have you still had nightmares since we last met? Were they about those monsters you drew for me? You're a very creative girl, but you can't let your fears take control of your imagination. In order for your nightmares to end, you have to face your fears. You have to face the monsters. Show them that you're not afraid. Do you understand? It's the only way. Now, Mary, I need you to try and remember what happened on that day a year ago.
Once this scene ends, you wake up in a room with a green bed and a blue origami cat. You're playing as a child, Mary Schmidt, the protagonist of Candy Swan, and you're dreaming, supposedly. The origami cat acts as your aide and guardian, explaining the game mechanics before dropping you into the first night. She recalls that Mary's father gave her a cassette player years ago with soft music in order to help her sleep. She also notes that the monsters hate light, so you should flash your flashlight at them when given the chance, except if they're under the bed. If they make it under the bed, you need to check underneath to see which side they went to, go back up, and look towards the opposite side. Once you hear them quietly emerge from the side you weren't looking at, you quickly shine your flashlight at them to make them go away. This section of the game seems to be taking place within the depths of Mary's subconscious, the deepscape, and the path laid out in front of you is where it's safe. The origami cat says that she can always help you find your way back as long as you're on this path. The darkness is dangerous. A note found along the path sheds some light on the earlier machinations of Candies as a corporate entity. The older wire animatronics were meant to be repurposed into the fully mobile newer models, and once you find the recorder and return to your bed, the tutorial portion ends and the game can finally begin. The game takes place in Mary's bedroom, and the tape recorder allows for time to pass more quickly when it's playing. After an amount of time, the track will stop playing automatically. Then the player must press the rewind button, which will slowly rewind the tape so that it can be played again. If the player wants to do this while music is still playing, they must first click on the stop button. If an enemy is underneath the bed, they will attempt to sabotage the tape. On the first night, you get introduced to the first antagonist, which is the monster rat. He starts outside the bedroom, and if the player hears thumping and knocking, it means he is either hiding at the door, in the wardrobe, or in the closet. The player must shine their flashlight at these locations to force him back. If the player does not force him back in time, he will enter the room and he will then stand in one of three locations within the room and a purple blood-like vignette will appear around the player's view. The player must shine their flashlight at his eyes, and this is easier said than done, as the monster rat will try to dodge his head around to avoid the flashlight. After about 10 seconds or so of this, the flashlight will flicker and monster rat will go underneath the bed. From there, the procedure that the origami cat instructed you on must be followed exactly, otherwise the player dies. Check underneath the bed, see what side he's on, go back up to the opposite side, wait for the sound cue, and then shine the light in his face to make him go away, and the process repeats itself. In this game, there are two different kinds of minigames, technically. A flashback minigame or a dreamscape minigame. The Dreamscape minigames are always optional, but they do reveal important lore details that I will talk about later. Since Night 2 is essentially the same as Night 1, I'll go ahead and talk about the first two minigames at the same time. The end of Night 1 is a flashback minigame, and it has you play as a younger Mary, at what we can assume to be the Rat and Cat Theater, the predecessor to Candy's Burgers and Fries. The end of Night 2 is also a flashback minigame, and it's actually pretty similar. One detail in this game that I think is pretty funny is this kid right here. They're a genuine hater. Anyways, the thing that makes this minigame similar is that you play hide and seek again, which is gonna be something that you do a lot in these, except this time with the cat instead of the rat. On night three, you now have two adversaries to contend against. Monster Cat is now present, and he behaves completely differently from the rat. 
He will appear from either the very right or very left side of the bed, and if not checked on, he will get closer over time before eventually crawling onto the bed. And if not checked at this state, Monster Cat will take the music tape and jump scare the player after a while, or when they look under the bed to check on Monster Rat, which ends your night. The Night 3 minigame is slightly different from before. This time we get introduced to the Puppeteer. Now, based on his title and his design, we can already tell right off the bat that this guy has something to do with the puppet from before, but for now that's all we really have on him. From there, you play hide and seek with the rat again and the same thing happens, you get caught. The room around you is no longer empty as Mary has begun to remember more about her past. Now, there is a timer for how long the player is allowed to stray off the path, and many secrets are hidden across the gaps between the paths. Running brings the attention of the shadow rat, so you must walk across these gaps, being mindful of your time. If the time runs out, then you might have to deal with something else. This is all optional, of course. Since the gameplay for Knights 4 and 5 is pretty much the same as Knight 3, I will skip straight to the next few minigames. The end of Knight 4's minigame essentially just boils down to playing hide and seek with the cat again, though it is worth noting that this minigame supposedly takes place on Vinny's birthday, so now we have a name for the puppeteer's puppet. Knight 5 also begins with a minigame like Knight 4. At this point, Mary has nearly fully recovered her memories. By the time this night is over, all would be revealed. It's the day of a surprise show, and because of that, there are far more people here than usual. This means that once they decide to play hide and seek, all of Mary's usual spots are taken, and no one lets her hide with them. In an effort to find a good spot to hide, she encounters the employee storage room, which has been kind of flaunted at the player's face this entire time throughout the whole game, but this time the door is wide open, so naturally, you would go in. She's never been in there before, so she probably thinks that it's a great secret spot that nobody would ever find her in, a perfect hiding spot. We get to find the puppet, Vinny, and some drawings that the children drew for the performers in the trash. On the table in the bottom right corner, the script for today's secret show reveals that they intended to reveal the name of the characters for the first time. The cat's real name is Candy. Mary hides in the locker, not knowing what she's about to witness. The rat comes in. He knows Mary went into this room, but the puppeteer quickly cuts him off, though. He knows that the rat's actor came into work drunk, and tells him that he can't work that way, he needs to go home. Imagine if the parents found out that a kid's performer was drunk on the job. The puppeteer had a good point, honestly, he had their careers in mind. The rat wasn't hearing any of it, though. Being the most popular character in the show had inflated his ego, and being drunk definitely didn't help. The argument and disagreement turned into a scuffle, and the scuffle turned into a fistfight. The rat, too drunk to maintain his balance after being pushed off by the puppeteer, tumbles backwards and hits the back of his neck on the sharp edge of a table and collapses. He's dead. The cat comes in. The puppeteer explains the situation, and he wants to make it seem like an accident. Since the rat had a tendency to be unstable, and the puppeteer just he, he can't fathom losing his career over an accident like this when he was in the right, he was obviously right about the argument. He can't lose his career over that. But the cat, being a more honest person, believes that they should tell the truth. But the puppeteer can't bring himself to do that. It, everything would be over, everything that he's ever worked for. The cat goes on to the phone and starts to call the police. And in the heat of the moment, the puppeteer gets an idea. Thinking about his career and his future, and realizing that he can probably get away with this, he can get away with this, he can kill him. He strangles the cat to death. And now he's just 
a victim of a freak accident. At least, to the outside. But we know, he's just a cold-hearted murderer now. He lies to the police, brings his diploma with him, the only thing that he truly valued in this room above even his companions, and Mary is left in the locker, sobbing, having seen and heard the entire ordeal. Throughout the game, Mary has been working with her therapist to overcome her trauma from this incident, and now she remembers. The therapist asks their assistant to arrange a meeting with the police and those responsible for this case because this needs to be brought to justice. And there's still one more thing that Mary needs to get over. Her guilt. Should she have told the police at all in the first place? She ruined the puppeteer's life, even though the whole thing probably wouldn't have even happened if she didn't decide to hide in that room. This is what leads to the final night, the final confrontation. Night 6 only has one enemy. Monster Vinny acts as a much more difficult version of the rat. His confrontations last significantly longer, and it's harder to aim your flashlight at his face. In general, he is significantly more aggressive than the other enemies as well. When he leaves the room, his movements even look like he's being puppeteered by a greater force. I honestly think that this is fantastic storytelling, and this game has some of the greatest of that in any Five Nights at Freddy's fan game. Once the night is finally done, we get a direct continuation of events from the previous minigame. Mary exits the building, seeing the bloody scene in front of her, and gets reunited with her father. The police don't even understand why she was still in there. They were supposed to do a sweep of the building, but she was so scared that it took her that long just to decide to leave the safety of the locker. On the sidelines, we can see the puppeteer, who has the audacity to cry while discussing what happened with the police officers. He's certainly lying right to their face, and his tears are not for others, but are his own, stressed out by a situation that nearly ruined his future, likely overjoyed that he was able to make it out of the situation with zero consequence. That is, until Mary remembered. Then we get the ending. Mary has fully recovered from her trauma, and the guilt has been lifted from her shoulders. Her therapy sessions can finally come to an end. Though this is technically the final game, there is one more game that I can talk about as of now. You see, although the story of Five Nights at Candy's was meant to end with the third game, on the fourth anniversary of the original Candy's game, Emil released Five Nights at Candy's Remastered, in which he reprogrammed and remodeled the entire first game from scratch. The gameplay is essentially identical, so I won't waste your time going over any details involving that. However, there is a secret present in this game that was not in the original. If you go onto the extras menu and zoom into the rat's profile and wait, this will happen. From here, if you enter the numbers on the Custom Night menu, you're met with Shadow Candy, who transports you to a secret night, the Null Night. There's now a purple overlay over the whole screen, the Origami Cat is on your desk, and Cam 13 is now available. When Shadow Candy reaches you, he doesn't actually kill you. He does deplete your power in reverse time by one hour, though. If the power runs out, he kills you pretty much instantly. However, if you manage to complete this challenge, you get treated to a secret teaser cutscene. I feel that 
time is beating in my hands. I don't know if I'm going insane or something. Nothing works. I know it should work, but it just doesn't. It's like he's... Stop until he stops. From here, we finally have all the pieces in place to summarize the entire series plot. So, here we go. In 1962, Mary Schmidt and her father make a visit to the Rat and Cat Theater while her brother is away at camp. She plays hide and seek every day she's there and is always caught, but eventually finds a way to hide in the employee-only room where she witnesses the accidental death of the rat's performer and the murder of the cat's performer at the hands of the puppeteer, whose puppet is named Vinny. The Rat and Cat Theater closes and Mary is left traumatized from the incident to such an extent that she loses the ability to recall those memories. The spirits of the performers go on to haunt their respective suits, and the suits are for some reason repurposed into animatronics with plans to reopen despite someone literally dying inside of them. Later, when the theater reopens, she returns with her brother. He gets a little too close to the stage, though, and gets attacked by the rat animatronic due to its possession, though he escapes without major consequence. From here, Mary's trauma only worsens, and she begins to go to therapy sessions after endless nightmares about the rat and cat. We learn from some hidden details in the Dreamscape minigames that the puppeteer who escaped consequence for his crimes originally went on to become a famous movie actor, where he played a disturbingly convincing, psychopathic villain. After overcoming her fear and guilt by facing her demons in her nightmares, she manages to pull through and can tell the police what really happened that day. Her testimony has the puppeteer brought to justice tried and executed for his crimes. However, those lost souls have yet to be laid to rest. The Rat and Cat Theater rebrands as Candy's Burgers and Fries, and they do see brief success. From here, the events of the Five Nights at Candy's two minigames can take place, and eventually the candy animatronic attacks a father after seeing him abuse his child. This incident causes the animatronics to be set for replacement. At some point, Mary visits the Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria location from the one before FNAF 2, and gets reminded of her past after seeing the eerily similar puppet. She gets a job at the Robotics Corp factory as a security guard, and stumbles upon the older tapes we see between nights in Five Nights at Candy's. She also gets confronted once again with Vinny, which is likely a manifestation of the puppeteer's vengeful spirit. He is angry that his life was ruined by her, and he knows exactly who she is, and plans to ruin her life. One night, Mary falls asleep on the job, and the rat disables the cameras by breaking them. He goes on to murder two children by putting them through the assembly machine, which fuses their souls to Candy and Cindy. Now, the new animatronics are debuted, and on an unrelated note, the new and improved Freddy's from FNAF 2 shuts down due to unfortunate circumstances that we already know of. From here, Five Nights at Candy's can occur. The previous night guard asks the junior manager to accompany him on one of his last shifts of the work week because he found something that he needs to share with him, but the manager declines. Uh, so remember that previous security guard I told you about? Yeah, so we got a call from the police today. Um, apparently he has gone missing. I, I remember, like, the day before his last night of the week, uh, he asked me to be with him on his shift that night. He told me there was something he had to show me. I know, it sounds crazy, right? <laughs> the next morning, the employees find that Blank has been severely damaged, probably by this employee, and he's gone missing without a trace. 
From there, he's just fired and sent a pink slip, since he doesn't seem to have any intent of coming back. And then the stage is set for an older Mary Schmidt, who takes up the now open position to further investigate what's really happening here. She finds that the animatronics are malicious and out to attack her, something that she probably didn't expect. When she was a kid, she was afraid of something exactly like this happening. After the end of the work week, Mary is rewarded with her check, but she comes back the next day, despite not being asked to do so. She returns again the next night, but is fired for tampering with the animatronics, most likely because she was on to something. But from here, she no longer had any means of interacting with the situation, so it seems like she just decided to let it go. In the late 80s and early 90s, Candy and Cindy are replaced by slightly upgraded versions of themselves, and Chester's upgrade plans are denied. Chester is given the key to the room the rat is in by the puppeteer's spirit, and Chester is destroyed, and the rat is allowed to roam freely. In 1993, the rat kills the current security guard, and Candy's is finally forced to shut down, along with the factory that provided the animatronic services. Fourteen years later, Mary's daughter, Marilyn, is dared by her friends to spend five nights in the abandoned factory that now houses the ruined remains of what once was the Candy's brand. After spending five nights surviving her adversaries, she burns the factory to the ground, and the spirits of all the remaining animatronics are finally at peace. And that's where our story ends, or at least it would have. Five Nights at Candy's 4 introduces a whole new rabbit hole's worth of information. All we know so far is that there is at least one newer animatronic, that being this newer Candy model. Based on this transmission, a Reddit post that clarified the game was still meant for the Click Team engine despite being free roam, and the game's general aesthetic, I'd say it's pretty safe to assume that this game is going to be at least vaguely inspired by Sister Location, and the disembodied voice we heard in the teaser log may be this universe's William Afton equivalent, but not in the sense that he's like a murderer or anything, but in the sense that he's the one orchestrating the game's events and may have been the one to construct this newer animatronic. For now, though, all we can really do is speculate, but it's exciting to think about this wonderful series still receiving new and refreshing developments even this far after its release. Overall, I think Five Nights at Candy's is definitely one of the best fan game series we've ever received, and I will go out on a limb and say that it's definitely the most iconic. I hope I speak for everyone when I say I'm really looking forward to the fourth game. There is also one last thing I would like to point out, though only briefly. There is a little spin-off game called Fnac Fur that Emil teased about eight or nine months ago at this point. That looks pretty cool, uh, but I decided not to talk about it substantially because we don't really know much about it. Anyways, remember to check out Surfshark VPN, the sponsor of this video. Code Manaxa, link at the top of the description. That's going to be all from me. I hope you enjoyed the video. Until next time.